today. I saw all kind of great food outside. First, the first Sunday of each month, we have this special fellowship time, and it is always difficult to get people back in here because there's so much good food. So the new policy is if you bring food for the fellowship time, make it really bad. Okay? So just kidding. Just kidding. Would you stand with me this morning? I can't overemphasize the importance of us coming together this morning. Let's not take it for granted and understand that uh, we're here to worship our Lord corporately. What a gift and what a blessing we have to be able to gather together this morning. So let's do just that. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to be here, and we are certainly blessed. What a beautiful morning and cooler uh, temperatures. We've had a fellowship with one another, and uh, it's just good to be able to gather in your name. Father, I pray that you focus. Uh, help us to focus. Uh, keep our eyes on you. And I pray that even here in our time together uh, on Sunday morning that you would uh, remove the things in our lives that distract us, that we would come here with the expectation that we're worshiping you, that we're praising you, that we're honoring you. And I pray that you would grow us in our, in our walk and our faith. May the songs we're about to sing uh, ring true in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name. All right, let's sing together, Great is the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. 
have a couple men to come down and help us with our offering. Let me lead you in a word of prayer if I could. Father, thank you for your presence here today. I pray that the song we just sang, Christ alone, will become a theme, not in our works plus you, but in Christ alone. May that be our prayer in our life. Lord, thank you for all your blessings this week, and may our offerings and tithes today be given in a generous manner, as your, as your word says, out of generosity, and an understanding that every dime that we have ever had comes from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. I have to confess something to you. I was going to play a joke on Sue this morning because I thought she was playing the piano and I put a fake roach on the piano. <laughs> and Laurie walked in this morning with my cup of coffee. Oh. And I warned her before she got to the piano, so I retracted that and I laid it on the sound booth so that Josiah could find it this morning. <laughs> I appreciate all the musicians and all those that are working so diligently each Sunday to uh, make sure that you hear songs are communicated in the, the messages and sometimes we have a little fun with each other just kind of picking on each other but I have to be careful because they bring me coffee every once in a while and I could be in deep trouble so anyway. <laughs> it is so good to see you here this morning and, and if you're visiting with us uh, thank you for being here today we have some cups and some other gifts back there. If it's your first time visiting with us, make sure you grab one in the entrance way or whatever that room is, the foyer back there as you walk out. And there are some cards on top of that table. It would mean so much to us if you just fill that out and leave it with us. Uh, it would just let us know who you are and um, so we can uh, get in touch with you or be praying for you or just find out a little bit about you. Um, 
You saw the pictures there during the offering. I am not a good photographer. That's why those pictures were off. But anyway, that is the, the ramp that is completed now. Thank the Lord. We have worked for three, uh, three days, counting that day, two Saturdays and a Friday, and completed that work. The Lord's given us the strength and the ability to do that so that uh, Mr. Bryce and Ms. Angela can roller skate up and down that ramp. And they can, um, it is the longest ramp I think we've ever built. We've built several in the last uh, several years, but uh, it's, the porch was 32 inches off the ground, so the ramp had to be 32 feet long, according to the standards of what is allowed on the slope there. Um, but anyway, thank you, all of you who worked so diligently to get that project completed. And we all had a good time doing it, even though a couple Saturdays we uh, it got so hot we just looked at each other and said, we got to stop, we have to stop. So, you know, the older we get, the, the more that affects us, for those of us that are getting older, anyway. But thank you all for such uh, diligent work. Also, just as an aside there, there is another ramp that we need to build coming up soon that we know of. And everyone can't do the, that physical labor, but if you want to help offset the cost of those things, uh, you can do that. Just notate that and you're giving. That would be wonderful. There's a lot of ways to minister to folks, and so um, I would encourage you to be a part of it one way or the other. Um, take note in your bulletin of all the things coming up, and what, what's happening in two weeks from today? Two weeks from today. Homecoming. Uh, we have sent out multiple cards inviting people, reminding them that it's homecoming. And we've had a couple of questions. Can anyone come? Of course you can. This is the church. So you can invite people at any time, in any service. Homecoming is just an emphasis on a reunion. Those that used to be part of Homewood's family, that we invite them to come back and celebrate and, and just uh, to have a special time together. And um, we will have this room set up quite differently because it's also the place that we have to eat and fellowship. So we will set up in like a banquet uh, style as we've done the last couple times, I believe. Um, so make note of that. And if you know of someone that should be getting a card who has not, let us know because for some reason several cards have come back. Even though the address is correct on them, they just come back. So we're gonna hand deliver those this week um, but if you know of anyone that hasn't received a card that should, please let us know. So that's two weeks. And then immediately after that, we will begin to take our, our, our donations for the giveaway, which will happen the next month. And you will have designated rooms back here to bring those things. Again, that is a free uh, yard sale. It's not a sale. It's just a giveaway. Uh, we have uh, soups and all kinds of stuff uh, food-wise. It is a great time for us to carry the gospel to the community, just to meet their physical needs and then give us an opportunity to meet their spiritual needs as we get to know them. And um, as a matter of fact, if Angie doesn't mind me mentioning, that's how we get to know Angie and her family last year at the giveaway. Uh, we met her out there and uh, she got to know a little bit about us and still came. So <laughs> we're thankful that she and her family are here. And I want you to know that, that the number one thing for the giveaway is not the clothing items or whatever it is we give away, the number one thing is to convey the love of Christ and to communicate that well to our community so that we want to do that. Also, uh, there's a feature in the bulletin each week now about the, the library and the items that we have in our library back there, whether it's books or Bible study uh, things or DVDs or whatever it is. Uh, so please make note of that always. And um, also, Janie Chapman, the missions offering coming up. Um, the 10th, which starts uh, the prayer and the, and the giving, which starts next uh, Sunday. So keep that in mind. Also, if you note on the back, your um, a list there of prayer concerns and praises. Uh, continue to remember Roberta. I think we're, we're streaming live now. Roberta, if you're watching, hey, get back to work. Come back. Um, we miss her. She, she had an appendix uh, removed, so um, she's sore. And she said this morning that she's trying to favor her stomach, which is causing back problems. You know, the, we would favor one side and the other side starts to hurt. But pray for Roberta as she's recovering from that surgery. Also, uh, please continue to remember the Lanny Anderson family as they had the funeral yesterday. And as a big family, and I don't know if you were aware of this or not, but there was a skating rink over on Adrian Highway. And Lanny and his family ran that for many years. Uh, but 
this is uh, Timothy, our son-in-law's uh, grandfather in the past. But continue to remember those and all those on our list and others that came up in Sunday school time this morning. So please continue to lift one another up in prayer as that is a very important thing that we do and uh, what a great gift God's given us. The ability to talk with him, to walk into the holy of holies and hearts and just talk with him and lift up the needs of others around us. Hey, Chip. Second Saturday, sing along. Four o'clock, this coming Saturday. Four o'clock, this coming Saturday, because today's the third. Thank you, Lord. This coming Saturday, thank you. Right here, are you in trouble? So right here, four o'clock. Thank you, Lord. No fake roaches, I won't bring anything. Children, can y'all help me down here just a second? group this morning. Did y'all start school back? Y'all been in detention yet? Nope. Everybody doing good? You like the teachers? All right. I'm just saying I'm praying for them if you don't. I'm praying for them. Okay. You doing good? I'm going to ask you to do two things. And it's not embarrassing. It's just two things. Okay. It has something to do with what we're studying about today. The first thing is blinking. Thing is, when I count to three, no more blinking. Okay, you can use your, your hands to help or whatever, but no more blinking. Y'all ready? Okay, you gotta watch them now. Okay, you ready? Go. Don't blink. You can't blink at all. Not blink. <laughs> Y'all are too busy. Keep going. I see blinking. I see blinking. All right, y'all can, can believe it. Y'all can believe it. Well, that's a little difficult, isn't it? Okay, a little bit. If you're walking out, it's not for you. So they don't blink either because they go to sleep. Do you go to sleep? You just stare. Just... Okay, well, this is the second one is a little different. Now, y'all did really well at that one. But the second one is this. You can't breathe. Okay, okay. You ready? You can't breathe. No cheating now. You ready? You can blink, but you just can't breathe. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> See how long you hold your breath. Oh, breathing going on. <laughs> okay, you can breathe. I don't want you passing out. You can breathe. Okay, today we're in Romans 7, and it's talking about the law. Y'all remember when we say the law, what does that mean in the Bible? What does it mean? Can y'all think of it? How about the ten most famous laws? You know about those? That's right. The Ten Commandments. If you look back at Exodus chapter 20, you'll find the list of the Ten Commandments. And the first ones were about God. Okay? Don't have any other gods before me. Okay? God says you got to honor him above all. Okay? Can't take his name in vain. They're all about, the first part's all about God. And then it gets to the part about other people, you know? Honor your mother and father. You still have to do that? You still got to honor mom and dad? Yes, we do. Okay. Honor mom and dad. Don't be killing people. Uh, don't be coveting. You know what that means? It means wanting something somebody else has so badly that you're willing to do whatever to take it. Okay. Don't be stealing, things like that. Those are, those are just ten of them. But throughout the rest of, of, of Leviticus and especially in Deuteronomy, there are tons of laws, tons of rules. So it's kind of like when I told you you couldn't breathe. When God gave the law and all these rules were added, people said there is no way. They tried. Not blinking is possible. You might have to use some duct tape, okay? But that's possible. But not breathing will end up with you dying, okay? So the people were so frustrated because they were trying their best to keep the law. And the more they tried, the more frustrated it got. What if I told you right now that somebody made these fresh cookies and they were waiting for you back there in the room, but you had to wait, you had to wait till I let you go back there. You start thinking about these cookies. And the more you think about it, the more you want them. I said, you can't have them right now. You, you 
inside you're going, I gotta get back there and get some cookies. Well, that's what the law did because the law said don't do these things. And in our hearts we think, hmm, I gotta do that. You ever had your parents say, Don't don't look like Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, you say, don't look in this room or don't look over here, and you think, I gotta look, you know, you're just tempted to do what you're told not to do. Well, that's reality. The Bible says that when we have the rules, something in us just makes us want to break them. It's just a natural, very natural thing. So that's what we're talking about today. I appreciate y'all helping me with that. So you can try not blinking if you want to on your own, but don't try to not breathe. That's a bad thing. Okay. Y'all give them a hand. Thank y'all so much for helping me. I appreciate the help that the children give us each Sunday. And some sermons are easier to preach and to teach than others. This one today is a particularly um, not difficult, and it's not complicated. But it is so pivotal. It is so important to our daily journey with God. And I have to ask the question, how many of us are trying to make it to heaven on our own? I don't think many people would raise their hand, especially not being in a church service. But there's a thing that we've been talking about for a while called the law. And as I mentioned it with the children, what the law did, it illuminated. Have you ever been in a room at night time sleeping or in a strange place and, and you can't get your bearings and then you turn the light on and then you figure out where you are or you reminded, oh, I'm in a hotel now, I'm not in my home or I'm Visiting family, and I wake up in a strange environment. It takes me just a second, but when the light's on, I get my bearings, okay? The law was just like that. It illuminated sin in people's lives. It didn't fix sin. Have y'all been speeding lately? <laughs> Some of us have. Y'all know what the speed limit is on every road you drive on? You do. So you can't use that for an excuse. When the officer pulls you up. Well, sometimes you think, I, I had no idea. But what happens when you find out the speed limit? Now you have a choice, right? Slow down or keep going, keep speeding or whatever it is you're doing. When the law was given, the people found out, this is sin. I've been doing this and I didn't know it was sin. And that way the law illuminated. It brought to light. The reality of a thing called sin. And I have to ask this question to you because the scripture asks this of us in verse 13. Is sin sinful to you? I want you to think about that. Is sin sinful to you? Because we live in a society where sin is no big deal. Sin is just a weak. It's just, ah, God understands. God knows the world we live in. He understands things change. Times have changed. We don't live back in the 50s or 60s or 40s or 30s or whatever. It's modern day. Are there still things in today's society called sin? In God's economy, the answer is always yes. Okay. So the question that I want to stick in your head today is, is sin sinful? To you. Let's read the text today. This is in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 13. We've been talking about sanctification, and we're still talking about that. But at this point, Paul is speaking to the church in Rome about the law, because that's all they've ever known. And he's trying to, to help them understand this transition between the law and grace. Verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became...
came alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, um, it, for me, it resulted in death for me. For sin taking opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandment, sin might become utterly what? Sinful. Now, don't answer this question. Now, have you ever been pulled over by an officer? And the first thing that came through your mind, maybe through your lips, was, I'm not as bad as they are. Did you not see that person that just cut me off? Or was, I'm not speeding that bad. Look at the rest of these folks. You ever done that? Some of you want to confess. <laughs> the law illuminated the sin. And Paul says, is it that the law was sinful? Absolutely not. The law was holy. It was from God. The problem was the sinner. We can't fix ourselves. You know that? I am not the solution to my own problem. I'm the problem. You're the problem. You know that? That's hard for us to say or to admit, but the Bible's very clear. So the law couldn't fix anything. It just showed up and said, here you are. Here's who you are. And the people said, I can do this. I can fix this. I can try harder. I can do better. I can work longer hours. I can save more. I can be more moral. I can do these things. And I'm, I'm better in a better standing with God. You know, the law points out the sin nature, not just individual sins. And I've, I've heard people talk about this a lot. Well, I've only done this and that. I haven't done that and that. You know, it's a like a list. But it's our nature within. How many of us have a sinful nature? Every single one of us, okay, have a sinful nature. We do. And it's hard. I, I was uh, sending a text earlier this morning about my struggles in the sermon today because I would love, love, love to stand before you and say, hey, this is y'all, okay? <laughs> I've already been victorious over this and I'm good to go. But the fact of the matter is, I am no more worthy to stand here and present a holy word of God than anybody else. But God called me to, and I have to come to grips with the fact that I am a sinner in my nature. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And it is not my doing that corrects that. It is in His doing and my faith in Him that corrects that. Do you see the difference? It is our faith in the Lord Jesus and our trust in his work, you and I will never be good enough. We will never be moral enough to make up for the nature that we're born with. We are lost until we place our faith in the Lord Jesus and the work of Calvary. That's a simple message of the gospel here. I want you to listen to Dr. J. Vernon McGee and his unique way of saying things. And he's talking about this particular text. He says, oh, the tragedy of the person who seeks to live by the law. It does not lead him to life. While it is true that God had said this do and thou shalt live, Deuteronomy 8.1, the doing of it was the difficulty. The fault was not in the law, but in the one who thought the law would bring life and power. I did neither. It merely revealed the weakness and ability of the sin of mankind. If there had been a law which could have been given, God would have given it. We'll find that in Galatians 3 bit later on. But life and Christian living do not come by the law. Understand that. Life and the Christian living do not come by the law. Let me illustrate this. He says a car is very useful and a, a very useful thing. But a car in the hands of an incapable driver can be a danger and a menace. In fact, it can be a death dealing instrument. The fault is not with the car. The fault is with the driver. The problem is man. He is the culprit. The problem wasn't the law. It's us. So is it important to be a moral person? Absolutely. Is it important to treat one another in the same way we would like to be treated? I think that's the golden rule, right? Is it important to be 
people of integrity in our business dealings. Absolutely. But how much of that will get us uh, an inch closer to God? None of it. Only faith in Jesus Christ. All those good things come out of it as the fruit, as the evidence of when you know God, when you love God, you want to do things for him just like you, you love other people and you want to do kind things for them if you love them. It's the same way with God. But none of that, folks, will get us an inch closer to God. Only faith in Jesus Christ will move us forward to the place we need to be. I want you to turn over to Galatians 3. I just mentioned it briefly. But I want you to go over to Galatians 3 because some people feel that if they could just keep the law better, they would be closer closer to God and be better off. Galatians 3, just a couple verses here, starting with verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? It's the same Paul still writing, but he's writing to a different church. May it never be, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe, not who perform, those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. In other words, it told us how much we need him. It's given us an idea of how much we come short of the glory of God, as the word says, and it has tutored us. It has led us to see how desperately we need our Savior, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. We don't need the law to teach us anymore. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And that baptism is talking about the Holy Spirit there. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Paul is talking to Jewish audience and their Gentiles as well. And sometimes the Jewish folks would say, well, listen, we're actually the lineage of Abraham. We're actually family. We have an inroad to God. And Paul says, listen, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. Slave, free, men, women, everybody must come by the same path. And that's faith in Jesus Christ. No one has an advantage because faith in Jesus is the only way. He is the door, not a door, the door. We have options here. He is one door, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying that as no one has an advantage just because of your heritage where you grew up, what your family's name is, how long you've been in the church, how much you've served, what offices you've held. If, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. He's telling the Gentiles as well as the Jews, it is by faith that you belong to God. It is by faith. You are grafted into the vine. Okay? By faith, not by works. That should relieve a lot of pressure. Take a lot of pressure off of us and a lot of burden because a lot of times we're carrying around the guilt of sin. We sing that song, God has taken away, he has canceled the power. He has taken away, canceled the, the forgiven sin, canceled sin. He's taken away the power that it holds. That's guilt. You and I carry around guilt for things that we can't fix, we can't make up for, we can't undo. I'm not going to ask you for a confession there, but I know we all have things we wish we could undo. But we can. God's taken that away through the cross. Every time that we get to a subject of this uh, nature, I, I always, I go back to my own struggles. And I go back to a constant reminder that you can't make up for the past. And you can't offer God a resume of here's my goodness. All we can do is admit, as the scripture says, that we're sinners and we need a Savior. And he's done all the work required to meet what God requires. His blood, the work of Calvary, that's the only payment that God will accept. It is by faith in Jesus Christ. One of the scariest passages in Scripture, 
people come to the Lord at the end of their lives and say, we fed the hungry and we visited the orphans and we did this and we did that. And, and as far as I can see, it's a sincere testimony. They really did those things and they really felt like it was enough. And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. If that doesn't make us stop and think something is wrong. Because if those folks could sincerely do good and moral things and still fall short, that should cause us to say, Lord, please, please stop me in my tracks if I'm heading down that path. Show me. Show me the clear way. And he does, folks. God's heart is for you to know him, to have a relationship with him, and to end up in eternity with him. But the only way is very narrow. His name is Jesus. And that's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I want you to understand that. And, the, and a point that I'll make here is a lot of times we focus on the law and the old way, the old covenant, now moving to grace and the new covenant. And so many people want to revert back to this because we can do this. We can do this old thing because we can keep rules. We think that that affects our relationship with God somehow. We just do that. That's called legalism, and that's what the Pharisees were doing. Don't walk this far. Don't eat that. Don't hang around with these folks. you got to do this and do that. And It's a bunch of rules, and we can kind of have control over that. But if we move into the new covenant under grace, we can't control that because it's only under the power and authority of Jesus Christ, and we must yield to that. That part is scary for us a lot of times because we like to be in control. You know that? I like being in control as well. I rode on the back of a motorcycle with one guy. Fell off the back. He kept going. Bad, bad experience. I thought the next time I get on a motorcycle, I'm going to have my hands on the handlebars. I'm not riding back here anymore. This is dangerous. Y'all like being in control? Yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the thing about Christianity, folks. It's a struggle. Not because it's complicated. It's because you got to let go of what's here. You have to let him be in control. God will not be your co-pilot. Nor mine. He must be on the throne in our hearts. He and he alone. <clears throat> Share something here from Will Gray. I've shared several excerpts from this devotional throughout the last several months. But I thought this was unique because it happened just a few years ago back in Charlotte. And this is what Will Graham, his grandson, wrote. And the scripture is from John 3.30. It says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And it goes to the text that we're talking about today. Several years ago on a cold, rainy morning in Charlotte, North Carolina, the groundbreaking was held for the new Billy Graham Evangelistic Association headquarters. For more than five decades, the ministry had operated out of the offices in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the relocation to the town of my grandfather's birth was a sort of homecoming, homecoming for him and the organization. Part of the way through the groundbreaking ceremony, my grandfather was introduced. Slowed by age, he methodically made his way to the podium as the crowd erupted in enthusiastic applause. For a moment, he silently stared at the crowd and of admirers, and then he spoke. His first words weren't about his successes or his love for Charlotte. They weren't about the millions worldwide who had attended the Crusades. They weren't about the many great years of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had in the Midwest. He didn't greet the dignitaries in the audience with proud words. Rather, he softly uttered the words of John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He paused, seemingly deep in thought, and then said again, He must increase, but I must decrease. In the middle of a ceremony meant by many to honor him, my grandfather genuinely disregarded, I would even say disdained the attention and redirected everyone's focus to his Savior, his reason for living. My grandfather knew that none of this uh, mattered if not for Jesus Christ. 
Not one moment of the time he spent away from his family as a younger man was about him or for him. It was all to proclaim the hope of the Savior. He has even shared in the past that he wished his name wasn't the name of the organization. It makes him uncomfortable because he never wants to claim any success. It's God at work. And my grandfather always recognized that he was just a vessel. My grandfather's attitude was a perfect lesson for all of us. When you look at your achievements in life, in ministry, with your family or job, do you put the focus on yourselves or on Christ? Do you edge toward pridefulness or do you seek to turn any accolades toward the one we serve? The one who gave us the ability in the first place so that we may honor him. I'll be honest with you, this is not easy. It tends to go against our human nature. Our innate motivation to, is to pump ourselves up, to cherish the spotlight, and to revel in our successes. Even while we give the glory to God, there's a voice in the back of our heads saying, Way to go, you did this. What I found so interesting about my grandfather, though, is that his was a true ingrained humility. It was a part of who he was as a servant of the Most High God. As you go through your work today, through good and through bad, through the victories and the struggles, keep these words in mind. He must increase, but I must decrease. You've seen what God has done with my grandfather, and he will use you as well as you humble yourselves and lift him up. The last part that we read there in that passage in Romans, in the 13th verse, chapter 7, says this. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Sometimes we approach God's throne so flippantly and arrogantly. We act as if he is a genie in a bottle that is waiting for us to tell him the next move he needs to make. He is God Almighty. He is creator of the universe. He spoke everything that we have ever seen and witnessed into existence just by his mouth. He is awesome, God. I would encourage you sometimes as we enter this room, even though this is not where he lives. He lives in you and in me. This is a special place. I would encourage you to come here prepared as brothers and sisters in Christ to meet with the Holy God. When you bow before him in your homes, or in your cars, or your jobs, or wherever you are, and you bow your head, don't flippantly just throw out a couple words there, God help me, forgive me, do this, do that. Understand that you're kneeling before the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Speak to him that way. The more we learn to respect him, the more we understand who he is, the more we understand who we are not, and the more we understand how much we need a gracious Lord. He is a loving Father, yet he is holy. Because of that, you and I have seen our sin through the law, but we can't fix it. Only because he is a gracious God did he provide his son. To, to bridge that gap. Sinful men and women. Holy God. Only by Jesus can we come together. I'm going to ask our praise team to come and share this last song as we sang last week. I surrender all. It's not about giving him part. It's not about giving him parts that are easy to give up. It's about him ruling and reigning in our hearts. Completely and totally. It says I surrender all. I'll be down here at the front if you need to come speak with me. The altar is always open. I know the altar is literally in your heart. Sometimes it just is a good thing to openly come and pray and let your brothers and sisters pray with you. And I would encourage you here at Homewood, if anyone ever comes to this altar, if a man's here, there should be another man right beside him praying for him. You don't need to know the details of what he's dealing with. If there's a woman that comes to pray, there should be another sister in Christ that comes to Pray for her beside her, no matter what she's going through. It's not to find out their business, but it's to help them, support them in prayer. We should never find someone alone at the altar. We should come down with them.
beside them, lifting them up in prayer. Let's take advantage of the time we have this morning to say, God, I'm not just singing this song. I really mean it. I surrender all because I understand I can't fix my problem. Only through Calvary, only through Jesus. Would you stand and just sing, I surrender?